we want to continue. Continue to praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. And everything that we do and everything that we say is all for God's glory. And that's why we are here. And that's what God has put you here for today is to give Him praise, give Him honor, give Him glory. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about this guy, Gideon. And this, this guy is a hero in the making. And he may not look like a hero. He may not act like one. And he may not even talk like one, but God sees something in Gideon that makes him want to use him as a hero, and he wants to use him in a very big way. Last week we said the angel of the Lord came to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, Gideon, mighty warrior. And so we're going to kind of pick up that warrior theme today. And over the next couple weeks even, we're going to see how Gideon kind of steps into this spiritual warrior for the things of God. And we're going to look at that familiar story where where Gideon takes his little army of uh, 300 and he goes against all these, these nations who come against him. They send their armies and Gideon's outnumbered some 450 to 1. And yet, even though he's way outnumbered, God uses Gideon to be a deliverer for Israel. And so we're going to talk about that. My hope for us as we continue to look at this story is that you will rally behind the one true hero, that you would rally behind King Jesus, that he would be the one that you look to, that He would be your deliverer, your redeemer, your rescuer, your peace, really everything, that He would be your all and all, and that your faith would grow, and that you would be in a position for God to use you. And that's kind of been our theme over these past few weeks, going to continue to be how God uses people and how God wants to use you to rise up, to step into God using you as even a hero, a hero to somebody else. Because I've said it before, I'll continue to say it, everybody needs a hero. Everybody needs a hero from time to time. The people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people in your house, even right here, among faith family, everybody needs a hero from time to time to encourage and to lift up. The reality is that we're all in a war. We're in a, a spiritual battle every day. Might not, might not feel like it, might not even acknowledge that, but we're all in a spiritual battle, and the battle is real. The battle is for your soul. The battle is for your peace. The battle is for your family. And so there's a war that continues to go on, even in our community and in the world at large. And so you are in a war, even though you might not be at war. And that's where we need spiritual warriors to stand up, stand firm, and to do the things that God has called us to do. Remember, our guide Gideon He's called by God to deliver God's people. And the children of Israel, they needed rescued. They needed some deliverance because they were turning away from God. And we covered that a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about that sin cycle. Remember, we talked about that sin cycle, and they started out the blessings from God. They were living in peace, and there was freedom as they walked out their faith and there was blessing and there was God's favor on their lives. But then they started that sin cycle where they turned away from God. And it was a, it was a drift away from God. And that happens. And there's consequences that come from drifting away from the things of God. And in their case... God handed them over to the Midianites. And because they turned away, and because they drifted away from the things of God and, been do- and did things that they ought not to have done, God said, okay, 
Here's the consequences for your sin, for your sinning against me. And so we read about how they, they just felt beat down. Their lives were miserable. They were going through a hard time, beat down, pressed down. Until finally they said, enough's enough. We can't take this anymore. And so they cried out to God, God help us, God save us. And God always promises that when you cry out, a sincere cry for help, God help me, God help us, God will always deliver. He will deliver, He will send a deliverer, He will rescue when you have a sincere cry for help. The sin cycle may sound like someone you know. Um, They're walking in God's favor, walking in God's blessing, and then there's a slow drift. There's a, and, and, and that can be small. It can be just a little thing. And, 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 and then it becomes a bigger thing, but a, a slow drift away from God. And then the consequence of that is an unraveling. There's an unraveling in your life that takes place where there's fear and frustration and there's hiding, and things aren't working out the way that they were supposed to, and you're really living a life that you know you're not supposed to be living. And when that happens, you need a hero. You need God to come and deliver you and to rescue you. Here in our story, God's children cried out to him, and he sends Gideon. He sends this hero to deliver them so that they can go back, not to stay in the sin cycle, but get back up to the top and live their lives in freedom and blessing and favor where they have purpose and there's provision and there's protection. And that's what God wants for each and every one of us, to step into this surrendered life to Jesus Christ where we live in, in, in wholeness. And we live in unity with one another. Gideon, very unlikely person for God to use. Um, He would definitely not have been the most likely person to succeed. Back in school, I might date myself a little bit. Maybe they still do that today. But back when I was going to school, they had this big list of, of most likely people to... Remember that? You guys did it. Do they still do that today? Still do that? Hadn't been canceled uh, just yet. About the, they, but we had a whole list of most, most popular, right? most athletic, um, funniest, uh, best couple. We just had a whole list that you would vote on at the end of the year. And then, uh, of course, if you remember that, most every class had the person most likely to succeed, right? Anybody get that award? Right? You voted for the most likely person to succeed, and that person was smart. Right? I mean, they were gifted and uh, outgoing, had these really big plans, and was most likely to succeed. Now, if they would have had a least likely to succeed, how many would have signed up? You probably would have won that award, right? You kind of goofed off in class, didn't really apply yourself, just kind of went with the flow. Isn't it funny how, how life happens? Life has a funny way of happening. Those people who most likely were considered to, to go on and succeed, and then those who were least likely to succeed, you show up at a reunion several years later, and it doesn't always turn out that way, does it? Sometimes it does. But sometimes it doesn't. You find out that that dude who was uh, most likely to succeed has kind of fizzled out. Might even turned into a dud. And then that person who everybody kind of wrote, ah, they're not going, she's not going to mount to anything. He's not going to mount to nothing. Turn out they find a niche in life. Things fall into place. And next thing you know, they've done quite well for themselves, right? Life has a funny way of doing that. Gideon was that kind of feller, simple farmer, didn't come from much, 
family kind of the least in the whole tribe, and Gideon himself was the least in his own family, full of fear, full of excuses, full of doubt. Definitely not the most likely person to succeed. Definitely not the most likely person for God to use as a hero nonetheless. But God saw something in Gideon that caused him to say, I'm choosing you to be this hero. And it wasn't because Gideon was all that. It was because God was all of that. Gideon wasn't all that, but God was. God doesn't call qualified people. God always qualifies those people who say yes, and then he does a work in you and through you to accomplish great things. And this is kind of Gideon's life. God had already told him, you're going to save Israel. But it's interesting that when we get into that here in just a minute in Judges chapter 6, before God sends Gideon out to this big assignment where there's conquering and there's victory and people's following Gideon, before that big event happens, God calls him to an assignment to just go home. Go home, take a stand, go back to your dad's house, take a stand for your faith, show your friends, your family, your community what it looks like to be on God's side. And so before, before he could go out and really conquer the world, if you will, God has an assignment right there at home. That's a, a good lesson for us. I would say before you and I can go out and change the world, we probably better first start at home. That you need to be a man of honor at home. You need to be a woman of honor at home. And so it always starts at home. It always starts with me. Uh, Before we can go out and make a big splash for the cause of Christ, let let us live a faithful life around those people uh, who love us and see us, and I know that, that's, that maybe that's the most difficult thing. Standing up for the things of God, taking a stand for Jesus with the people that you know, the people who are around you all the time. Sometimes that can be difficult to, to take a stand and to take a lead and to take charge. A whole lot easier maybe to go somewhere where nobody knows you. <laughs> Nobody knows me. I'll go and I'll stand up for Jesus. I'll say whatever because it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you say. I'll just go back home. It's a whole different ball game to stand up for Jesus um, on your basketball team, in your class, people in the office, people you hunt with, your golfing buddies, people in your dorm room. Right? It's sometimes a lot harder to stand up for Jesus and the things of God among the people who know you best, but God calls us, calls you to do just that. To be that spiritual warrior for God, to stand up and say, I'm all in. That this is my life, that I'm going to be a, a mighty man of faith, that you're going to be a mighty woman of faith, And not because you're all that, but because God is all that. You're not all that. I'm not all that, but God is. The light that shines the farthest will shine the brightest where? At home. And so this is what what Gideon is going to find out before he can go out and just really do amazing things that we continue to talk about thousands of years later. He first has to go back home, and so let's read that in Judges chapter 6, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week and God's Word. Judges chapter 6, beginning at verse 25. It says, Now on the same night, the Lord said to Gideon, and I'll just pause right there just for a second, the same night, see, all of this is happening all at the same time. <laughs> Gideon afraid, out in the field, hiding. The angel of the Lord comes to him, says, Gideon, you're going to go save my people. Okay, I'm with you, oh mighty warrior, right? man of valor. Uh, you're going to save my people. 
And so this is the same night that Gideon gets that. And so he says, take your father's bull and a second bull, seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this strong stronghold in an orderly way. And take a second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the asher which you shall cut down. So the picture is God tells Gideon, go home, go out in your dad's front yard. And there's a little G God there in your dad's yard. It's, a, it's an idol of Baal. And sitting right next to it is this totem pole Asherah thing where people's coming to, to worship. I want you to go there, Gideon, and I want you to tear it all down. Go to your daddy's house, tear down these idols where people are coming and they're worshiping, they're thinking that, they're gonna, that, that these things are going to provide security and peace and happiness and prosperity and love and hope and all of these things. You've got to go to your, your dad's house because that's not how it works. Go and tear all of that stuff down. I'm asking you to be a warrior. Take a stand for the Lord and go and tear this down. We can't have people at your dad's house worshiping false little G-gods. And so this is Gideon's assignment. And he was going to prove to them that they needed to change, that things needed to change. They were in a mess anyway, right? I mean, they're in this sin cycle where things are hard for them. They're miserable. They're hiding. They're crying for help. God, help us. Save us. And yet, right in his dad's front yard are these idols. And so God is telling Gideon, you can't, you can't do that. You've got to get to the root of the problem. Obviously, the people of God were not, um, they were not experiencing any good fruit. <laughs> All the fruit that they were experiencing were bad. They were just bad. Everything that was going on, crops, bad. Everything was a failure. Everything was a wreck. Everything was a mess. But they were hoping that somehow they could get good fruit by calling out to God. But God's saying, Gideon, it doesn't work like that you got to go and you got to get to the root of the problem. Life stunk for them because what was happening in his dad's house and outside of his dad's house. And so he said, if you want life to be different, if you want things to change in your life, then you're going to have to clean up your act. And so his first assignment was go to dad's and tear down those idols and it's the same for us if you want to see real change in your life you know if, if, if you don't want life to continue to be a mess if you want an end to the to the struggle and the addiction and the anger outbursts and the guilt and the frustration we always have to get to the root of the problem because we'll always just have we'll have fruit it'll always be bad fruit until we get to the root of the problem, and then God can deal with that and deal with us, and then He's able to provide the good fruit that we want to enjoy. And of course, today in our 21st century, when we talk about idols, uh, you know, I know, we're not talking about some piece of wood that you carve out and I mean, we're way too sophisticated for that, and the, the enemy is way too clever uh, for that. And so we, we have lots of other idols, uh, and, and you just start naming them. Anything that takes the place of God, um, that it's always a poor substitute for God that, that, that we're hoping is going to bring peace, security, happiness, love, prosperity, all those things... We look to something else other than God, and then that becomes our idol. That becomes the idol, whatever takes the place from God, and it never delivers, right? It never delivers those things that you put where God is supposed to be. 
And obviously there's nothing wrong with wanting peace and security and love and hope and all of those things. All of those things are nice and all of those things are good. They all come from God. Every good gift comes from above. So we know that. And so it's not wrong to ask for those things or even desire those things. But again, the problem comes when we expect to get those things without having God in the center of our lives. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. The idols take away from God. They take our time away from God. They take our worship away. They take our heart away from God. And again, there are a number of things that can do that. And you know what those things are. The call to worship passage that Michelle read this morning, I just, we just have to read that. Psalm 139, right? Search me, O God, right? Just find out what, what's, what's going on in my life that I have replaced you with. And then let me know about that so that we can deal with that. We need to tear those things down. And we acknowledge that and we say, those things are keeping me, those idols, those things that, that are replacing God, they're really keeping me from enjoying freedom and peace and purpose and all of the things that God has for me. They really block God from doing what He wants, you, what he wants to do in you and through you. And so we really shouldn't have anything in our lives, obviously, that rival God. God is here on the throne of our lives. He's calling the shots. So we shouldn't have anything that, that would come and, and rival God, and yet that's what idols do. They come and they rival God, and sometimes they surpass God where He's not on the throne of our life anymore. And these things over here. Uh, become idols and they become more important. Less, uh, God becomes less important, less vital. Uh, um, he becomes lesser than. And, 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 and anything that's going to rival God, we just need to get rid of. And that's what God is telling Gideon. You've got to get rid of these idols. And of course, our step is to confess that when we get to that point and we realize, wow, you know what? It may have started out with a slow drift, just kind of a, not really a walking away from God, but just a, just a slow drift. And then consequences come because of that. We just need to confess that to God and say, God, I am following you. I, 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 I want you to be on the throne. I don't want anything to rival you. And we've got to really, I mean, be serious about that. You know, sometimes, you know, we'll say, well, you know, I, I have these other things. I believe, I believe in God. That's not going to cut it. Um, you know, there, most people believe in God. The Bible says even demons. <laughs> even the demons believe in God, so that's really no big deal. Uh, it, it gets to, to be a big deal when you say, you know what, I don't only believe in God, but I believe God. I believe who He is. I believe who He says He is. I believe in the promises of God. And so I'm going to surrender my life. Everything that I do, everything that I say, is going to be focused on, on what you want. I want to live the faithful life. I want to be faithful and true to the things of God. Amen? So now, as you do that, and that's a lot, but as you do that, there, you can expect some things to happen when you take a stand and you're this, this is a spiritual warrior for the things of God. And so that's what I want to share the rest of our time uh, is, is a couple of things that you can expect when you take this stand for Jesus and become the spiritual warrior that God has for you. Uh, one, expect to be uncomfortable. Uh, Gideon was uncomfortable, uh, to say the least. <laughs> Very uncomfortable situation. For you to stand up for the things of God sometimes is going to be uncomfortable. It just is. I was thinking about cleaning the house this week. I didn't end up doing it. I just thought about it. But I thought about, uh, I thought about, don't tell she's downstairs. Nobody tell her. Uh, don't even tell her I thought about cleaning the house. But 
I thought about a couple different ways, two ways to clean your house. There's a kind of a surface level cleaning that goes on, and then there's a deep dive cleaning. I want to talk about the first level, my favorite, the surface cleaning level first. Uh, this is what happens when somebody calls you up and says, hey, I'm close by. I think I'll swing over, right? That's surface level cleaning when you know you got five minutes and you might wipe off the counter but everything else man you're shoving in cabinets you're throwing stuff uh, in closets you're shutting the door if you can get the door shut after all the junk that you put in there you're kicking stuff underneath the bed surface level cleaning person walks in wow Man, your house is nice. This is really great. And you're just praying to yourself inside. Please don't open the door. Please don't open the door. Don't look under the bed, right? Surface level cleaning. And then there's a deep cleaning that I know nothing about. <laughs> so I'm going to read my notes. Where you go... Every nook, every cranny gets cleaned, right? St old stuff gets thrown out. Closets are organized. Bathrooms get scrubbed and cleaned. Windows get washed. Sheets get washed. Refrigerator and stove gets a good cleaning. All of this deep cleansing, it's all intentional. Labor intensive. <laughs> Right? That's hard work stuff that goes on and it's time consuming, but it makes a big difference to your house. In our spiritual life, a lot of us, we, we like God to do surface level cleaning. Right? God, do a, do a surface level cleaning on me so that when you walk in and you see me and say, hey, my, wow, man, you, you got it together, brother, right? I mean, you've got it going on, you've got it together, and I'm thinking, wow, don't open any doors, right? Because I got, I, got, I got issues over here, and I've got junk over here in this closet, and I've got, right, surface level cleaning is not the way to go. That's never what God intended. God always intended for us to do a deep dive, a deep cleansing in our spiritual lives where it's intentional and where it's transformational okay you, you never experience transformation and real change with surface level cleaning it just won't happen and try and try and try and i've been there and i've tried it it just don't work it just don't happen okay the only way you will get transformation where your life will really be changed is to do a deep intentional cleaning and say god all of me right i'm just gonna everything that i have is, is is yours you are on the throne of my life help me to get rid of get down to the root of my issues the root of my problems and i'm going to surrender all of that to you and this is what gideon is doing before he goes out there to save the world he starts at home, and he starts with getting rid of the idols, replacing those idols with God, and I don't have time to go into that, but another point there is when you replace those things, get rid of those things, throw those, those things out, you've got to replace those things with the things of God. It doesn't do you any good to get rid of a bunch of stuff and then not fill it up with the Holy Spirit. And I'd really like to go into that more, and I will sometime, but it's really important. You throw all that stuff out. If you don't fill it up with the things of God and the Holy Spirit of God, then the enemy will fill it up with whatever he wants to, and then you're ten times worse off than when you started. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, fill, get rid of it, but make sure, God, now fill me. Fill me. Lead me. Empower me by your Holy Spirit. Right? I want to be filled, I want to be led, and I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And so fill me, get rid of all this junk. Lord, you be magnified. We just got through singing the song. Uh, you know, Lord, uh, be glorified in my life. Lord, be glorified. And so the step that you take to be 
uh, to make God glorified and to magnify Jesus in your life, you're going to experience some opposition, but you're also going to, or you're going to experience some uncomfort, you're also going to experience some opposition. And that's kind of one of where I want to land here with this opposition. Gideon, when he tears down these idols in his dad's front yard, he has some opposition. And you can read about that in verses 28 through 35 there. They wake up early the next morning, and the altar of Baal had been torn down, and the Asherah beside it had been torn down. And so they ask, who did this thing? And somebody spills the beans... And they tell, it was Gideon. And so they go to Gideon's dad and they say, hey, you need to bring your son out because he's fixing to die. That's what's going on. That's kind of the picture. The dad says, uh, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. If Baal is really who you says he is, then let Baal handle it. Let, if Baal's going to kill my son, then let let Baal handle it. He's big enough to do that. And so that's kind of how that unfolded, but there's opposition. Opposition against Gideon. And I would say for you, when you take a stand for God, sometimes there's going to be opposition. And I would say, don't back up. Don't back down. Take your stand. And you can say, as for me in my house... We are going to serve the Lord, and you don't have to say that with attitude. <laughs> you can say that very humbly. You know what? For me and my house, we're just going to worship the Lord. That's what we do. That's kind of what we're about, and we're just going to worship the Lord. And this is what Gideon was saying. We've got to get to the root of the problem so that we can experience the fruit in our lives. And I'm not... Gideon's dad here, you read that, and to be honest, I really don't know what, <laughs> what he's thinking exactly. Is he, is he afraid that his son's going to die, that Baal's really going to... Is he protecting his son when he comes out? Um, I don't really know for sure. I would like to think that he's kind of actually relieved and happy that his son has tore down those altars. I, I, I would like to think that, that, that his dad is, is saying, you know what, I'm glad that my son did this. He did something that I didn't have the guts to do, should have done it a long time ago, but now my son, my boy, has done it. And so a part of it, you know, I'd like to think that that's kind of where his attitude is and where he's at. And I get this because when they do say, hey, bring your son out so that we can kill him, he's like, You know, if, if, if Baal wants to, to take revenge on my son, then so be it. But it seems to me that Gideon's dad was thinking, um, Baal, Baal wouldn't kill my son because he couldn't. He couldn't do it. Baal wasn't God. God was God. And so he knew that Gideon would be fine. When you stand up for God, you can expect some opposition from some people, but you can also expect God to be with you, the Holy Spirit of God with you, and maybe God will use you to help save your dad, your mom, your cousin, your friend, your co-worker. Yeah, when you take a stand for God, they might... Some people might make fun of you. It happens sometimes. Might make fun of you at work, might make fun of you at school. Preacher boy, preacher girl, open up your Bible, go pray. You know, sometimes they poke fun at you for some stuff like that. But I will say this, when those people who kind of mock, can mock you at times, when those people's lives get turned upside down, guess who they go to? And I don't say that lightly. I'm just saying when, the, when those people, when their world gets turned upside down, they go to your office. They come knocking on your door. 
they call you up on the phone, and that's an opportunity for you as your spiritual warrior, God using you, that's an opportunity for you to be ready and say, yeah, I, I don't just believe in God, I believe God, and I believe His promises, and I'm going to live my life serving Him, being faithful and being true to the one true God. And you don't have anything to worry about because God is on your side. And, and again, people may come against you. They may give you a hard time. This culture that we live in, definitely going to come against you. But stand firm. Don't back up. Don't back down. Just stand up for the cause of Christ. Stand up for the things that God has, has put on your heart and put on your mind. And our verse for that, and we'll close with this, our verse for that is 1 John 4.4. 4. 1 John 4.4 4 says you, talking about you, as you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. You're overcomers. You've overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And that's a promise of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is out there, whatever you face, you are greater. Again, not because you're all that, but because God is all that. And when you're on his side, you have nothing to fear. And what's more, you have a faith family. Isn't that awesome? You look around today and we've got a faith family that will stand with you as you're going through some stuff, lifting you up in prayer, supporting you, encouraging you, celebrating the good times, praying with you during the valleys, you have a faith family who will also stand with you. As Gideon leaves, and I'll just, Gideon leaves his dad's place after all of that stuff had just happened, it all went down, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came on Gideon, and his family and his friends and neighboring tribes began to follow Gideon. And that was what God was wanting to get accomplished in the first place, that they would change. And so Gideon leaves that place and he has followers, people who have got on board and said, you know what, Baal's not God, God is God, and we're going to follow the one true God. And so may it be with us that as you leave this place today, that you will go led by, filled with, and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God as you walk out your faith in the journey that God has given you. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our rescuer. He is our redeemer, our deliverer. He is everything. Jesus is always enough for everything that comes into our lives. And so we just thank you in advance for all the answers to prayer that you have for us. We love you, and we ask that you would go with each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.